In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I wasn't fleeing from the sermon there, I just was in the dark, which was, uh, you know, just an outward invisible sign of all sorts of things, I guess. I'm often in the dark. If you missed Mother Brittany's sermon last week, I hope you'll go back and listen to it on our YouTube channel sometime this week. It's a meaningful and good and enriching offering for living our life of faith in the face of fear. And if you do, you'll get the chance to hear of her deeply irrational fear of snakes. Irrational, perhaps, but very, very reasonable to some of us and something we share. Last week's readings mentioned snakes repeatedly, and so she offered a great story on an epic battle that she and a roommate once waged with a snake, actually an earthworm. (laughs) Spoiler alert on the story, you have to go listen to it. And the power of fear in our lives. So it seems only right on the heels of that and on a day when green seems to be the color of the day all around us to call up one detail of Patrick's story that is nothing but lore. It was Patrick who was known as a good and faithful and effective evangelist who gave his life to spreading the good news of Jesus across England and Ireland. Now all of that seems to be true. Tradition and legend alone, though, tell us that it was Patrick who was attacked by a group of snakes while on his missionary visit to Ireland one time. A story that perhaps tries to explain why such creatures can't or at least couldn't be found on that country's shores. This legend is no recent phenomenon. It, has some, it is some several hundred years old, after all, so it has had some staying power. Now, though, scientists have gone on to debunk it with tales of a couple of different ice ages and their effects on the country of Ireland, but all of that is the boring part. We want the exciting, much more fun, if completely untrue part of Patrick's life and his credit for banishing all of the snakes from Ireland forever, a true hero among us. Though the snakes brought fear last week, this week there is hope on the other side of fear, or at least in tension with fear, as there always seems to be. Now, in full disclosure, I'm not sure that there's a natural interplay between St. Patrick and these lessons that we've just heard that folds together nicely, but today's story from John, John's Gospel pulls us into a deeper and closer invitation to behold the cross and Jesus' own crucifixion on that cross. And even more than his death alone, John is always wanting us to take a deeper look at Jesus' resurrection and ascension to come. Any time we gaze upon the cross, any time we find ourselves encountering the story of these coming couple of weeks of Jesus' last day on earth, we find that hopes and fears, chaos and peace, destruction and goodness, death and life all meet on that cross and then in that empty tomb. The story we just heard from John's Gospel drops us in in something of a strange place in the narrative arc, especially for what we will hear next Sunday. Our story today begins, now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. The story that immediately precedes this one and that gives the context for ours today is the story we read next Sunday on Palm Sunday when we hear of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You've likely heard it before, and if you haven't, haven't, and even if you have, I hope you'll join us to hear it again. It's the story that tells us that that there was a great festival taking place in Jerusalem, and the large crowd that gathered then heard that Jesus was coming. So they would take palm branches and wave them, shouting, Hosanna, and hailing him as king. I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in the crowd that day. The crowd that gathered that day was overflowing with the entirety of human emotion and experience. Remember, just before this triumphal entry, Jesus has raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And so the feeling of some parts of the crowd that gathered and gathered on that day was profound and expectant hope. Is this the one who can finally save us? 
Is this the one we have been waiting for? Is this the one that we have heard so much about? Is this the one who promises a life much fuller than what we have endured day in and day out? And right there within that hope-filled, expectant crowd was also one brimming with anger and fear and scarcity. After all, this Jesus is the one who was already being hailed as king, not the king of their own world. This was one who who has demonstrated greater power than they had seen anywhere else. This was one who was beginning to gain a large following. This Jesus was one who would flip every system and structure they had put into place for maintaining their power, their empirical control on its very head. And so this rage and fear and threat to their empire overflowed into the story we know as Jesus' crucifixion. They determined he must be put to death. In the line immediately before our story for today, the Pharisees, beholding a crowd filled with hope and joy and possibility, having been inspired by a love they had not known before and the idea of what could be for their lives, say to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Amidst all of that, our story begins with some Greeks, we are told, who come to Philip, one of Jesus' disciples. We are told they are Greeks both to remind us that the whole known world was present for this moment and that the promises about to be revealed are for the whole world too. The Greeks come to Philip himself with a Greek and not a Hebrew name and start something of what I like to imagine as an ancient telephone game. Sir, we wish to see Jesus, they say. They say it to Philip, who tells Andrew, who goes with Philip to tell Jesus, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I often wonder how that went. It seems to me that everyone that gathered that day did, whether they also wanted to see Jesus, whether because he offered them great promise or because they were mounting a case against him, but they all wanted to see him. So in some ways, it's something of an obvious request. And yet it is still quite bold, quite faithful even, and certainly extraordinary. We wish to see Jesus. It seems to me that that is exactly our request each time we gather here, really each and every day. We wish to see Jesus, the one who has come to be one of us, and in so doing knows our heartbreaks and our sufferings, our longings and hopes, our joys and what gives us peace. We wish to see the one who is God come among us, who showed us that God really does so love the world that God would send God's own child to die for that broken and yet lovely, sinful and yet redeemed world, for God so loves the world. We, like the ones who our story tells us, we, like they, want to see Jesus for in so many ways and in too many times and because of way too much heartbreak and suffering and chaos and violence within our days, well, he seems to be the only real one that might redeem it all, might make some sense of it all, might offer some peace beyond our understanding. We, too, wish to see Jesus. The text gives no real indication of how Jesus immediately responds to this request other than to give them and us something of a classic, enigmatic Jesus response. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I imagine Philip and Andrew saying, yes, sir, of course, but some folks want to see you. Jesus knows that they will see him. He knows what it is about to come in the story. He knows what is going to happen to him, that this is his last trip to Jerusalem, that this is one of the last times he will speak with them. He is saying that what it is to see me is to behold a grain that goes into the earth and dies and bears much fruit. That is to behold Jesus. He knows that they, that the world, that even you and I will soon see him arrested and tried and then put to death on the cross And when it all seems to be the end, we will see that the tomb is empty and he is raised. 
Jesus goes on to say today, whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, there will my servant be also. Though we are still in Lent, we are also quickly upon the Holy Week pilgrimage and this story sort of shifts us even closer. And it is there in Jesus' life and death and resurrection that we see not just a promise made for the whole, whole world, but a call to profound discipleship that asks us everything of our lives. You see, to see Jesus as we hope, as they hoped, is to know that we too are called to be but a grain that falls into the earth, one that dies to ourselves, that dies to the, to the demands and pressures of our lives, that di dies to our striving and seeking after selfish wants, that dies to the fear that holds us back and tells us we aren't enough, that dies to our ego and pride that seeks to make us strive after all that is shiny. For in so doing, in so dying to that, we also bear the kind of fruit that Jesus calls us to bear, fruits of goodness and hope and love and life. And to see and be the kind of Jesus was, the kind of disciples, the kind of person he was, the kind of Jesus that we are yearning for, is a profound call to daily discipleship, to daily following him, which looks exactly it looks precisely like doing the same things that he did too. Feeding and tending his sheep, testifying about him to the world, seeking after and finding the lost and forgotten, enacting hope for the hopeless, enabling life for those facing any kind of death that this world would deal. For in so doing, I am convinced that as we find ourselves encountering Jesus' death and resurrection again soon, we will also discover that it is in the daily following and his call to serve and follow him by serving and loving those around us. We, we who wish to see Jesus will discover that he is around us every day.